This guy needs to educate himself. If he would honestly look at the facts, he would see how wrong his supposed science actually is. It took him three tries to get a decent introduction. He makes gross errors and refuses to concede when he's wrong. Just like all evolutionists, he doesn't even research the science he presents. Why doesn't this guy just throw in the towel and admit he's wrong? I had to investigate. Okay, it took me three tries, but I think I finally got the intro right, and judging from the comments, you all seem to unanimously agree. I think I'll stick with it. On the other hand, yet another season has gone by, and I did make some obvious mistakes. In episode 41, I stated that Darwin might be considered racist by today's standards. As Der Deutsch Adler, Paul D. Hoff, E.E. E. Ehrenberg, and Jumping Spider pointed out, I was remiss in failing to point out that Darwin was actually quite progressive for his day, and emphatically opposed slavery. I I also stated that the word race is a term which historically meant species. As Piro von Hyperborea pointed out, this isn't completely accurate, and he gave me quite the etymology lesson. I mean, really long. In episode 45, I used the word spinal. Wildwood Claire was good enough to correct my pronunciation as the word is actually pronounced spinal. In episode 49, I depicted a very large horseshoe crab as an example of how big they can get. Evolution 1101 and Lauren Dimitruk expressed suspicion that the picture was photoshopped. It was JFB1111 who investigated far better than I and discovered that the picture is not photoshopped. The giant horseshoe crab? is a model. Also, in showing the similarity of the basic morphology of horseshoe crabs to trilobites, I accidentally presented a trilobite instead of a horseshoe crab. Once again, thank you to Evolution1101 for pointing that out. When I posted episode 49, I had no idea that I was posting it on the 78th anniversary of the coelacanth's discovery. Thank you to Adam Groggery and Condor Base for pointing that out. In the episode, I stated that all fossil coelacanths were under a foot in length. Adam Groggery drew my attention to a prehistoric species called Mossonia, which grew to be the size of a great white shark. It was also in this episode that Max Crows brought to my attention that I continuously jump from metric measurements to the American standard. In the future, I will attempt to be consistent in the standards I use in the course of a single episode. In episode 51, I began to notice a trend in the comments, which culminated in the comments for episode 52. Bad puns. Horrible, atrocious puns. They've continued since, but the undisputed master of them is Skeptical Sans. Thank you all for the laughs. In episode 55, R. Steve Warmery Com and Hey Hey Harmonica Luke were good enough to point out my pronunciation. Cetitians and Basilosaurus. The words should have been pronounced Cetaceans and Basilosaurus. Thanks for that. In the episode, I referred to Ambulocetus as exemplifying the upward migration of the cetacean nasal cavity. The celestial cave lion pointed out that Ambulocetus doesn't have a preserved nasal cavity. What I should have said was Ambulocetidae, the cladistic family name. In episode 56, Troy Britton and Exobite Spider were good enough to point out that I had mistakenly placed Indricotherium in the equine family tree. While similar, they are far more closely related to rhinos. Troy Britton and Alienbird also noticed that I had placed a picture of Hyracotherium where I should have shown Dinohippus. In episode 58, I mentioned that we know of fossil living things going back as far as 3 billion years. This was correct, but only a few days later, scientists announced that they had found 3.7 billion year old fossils, so I'm already out of date. The thing about science is that it progresses. Just before episode 59, I noticed a sudden interest in my channel. After doing some investigation, I discovered that none other than Aaron Ra had shouted me out on his Facebook page. I can't thank you enough. Your viewers have given me some excellent critique and insight. Episode 59 doesn't even get past the intro before going afoul. As Sean Nanoman and Jenny RN2005 pointed out, I misspelt Earth. Wow, I misspelt Earth. Huh. Also, CapQ57 corrected me as I had mistakenly screwed up on the direction in which the Niagara River flows. Now that we're at episode 60, it's time for me to announce that I'll be taking another hiatus and I will be returning again in October, as usual. I'm still working on the Evolution of Religion series that I mentioned in episode 40. It's just taking longer to develop than I had planned. I'll be starting a not-so-regular series called Tony Talks in late May. In this series, I'll be covering non-creationism-related topics. Additionally, I'm going to start posting animated versions of my stand-up comedy bits. I'd also like to start doing debates. If there's someone you'd like to see me debate, let me know. If you're someone who wants to debate me, let me know. Maybe we can make it happen. Early in my first season, I got my first shout-out and had no idea who had done it. 
It turned out to be Fish Head Salad, and he expressed to me how much fun he has shouting out channels without warning. In keeping with that tradition, I'm going to be doing the same thing for a few up-and-coming channels I really like. They have no idea, so please check them out and give them a shock. This first shout-out is way overdue. Deconverted Man shouted me out in my first season. He has a very off-center take on things. Check the deck against myself. The debate topics that I've chosen are so easy for him to knock down and win that it's just not worth his time. So if I've got this right, I don't know, I'm a pretty big idiot, so you guys and gals are going to have to watch his video and tell me if there's a different conclusion to be drawn based on what he said. But if Incidentally, if you'd like perhaps one more episode of this series, I highly recommend you go over to his channel and watch the episode we did together on The Big Bang. He parodies me perfectly. The next shout out is someone who may not even know I'm watching him. Professor Stick also takes on creationism and other religious arguments with his own simple animation and style. Because we can't possibly know the exact date of the Earth. It's literally impossible to narrow down the age to a single year. That 50 million year range is only a 1.1% inaccuracy. Do you know how little that is? That's pretty much as accurate as we can get. If you say 50 million years old, sure it sounds like a lot, but it's the percentage that matters, not the absolute value. And notice how your stupid 6,000 year old hypothesis doesn't even come close to fitting in within that range. The next shout out goes to someone who beat me to the punch in doing an episode on Y chromosomal Adam. Apologia is the perfect channel for you. We cover a lot of the same topics and I often feel he does a better job of conveying the science than I do. Go check it out. I wanted to tell you a little bit about me, my journey, my goals for this channel, and why my first focus is creation today and a certain Eric Hovind. Raised in a Christian home, I was a believer and follower of Jesus for over three decades. I attended a Bible college and was later active in youth ministry, encouraging hundreds of teens to memorize the Bible as divine words. I believed it. Now, last year, I shouted out Christy Winters, and some of you lost your minds. This year, the rest of you are going to lose your minds. Dreamy Diglot is a YouTuber who does videos on a variety of topics in her own quirky style. She's an atheist and not an SJW, so check her out. $320,000 for a bachelor's degree. 300,000 euros. 260,000 pounds. It hurts me to let a $20 bill out of my hand. Now try envisioning yourself working over 16,000 Andrew Jacksons. Imagine how many hours you'd have to work to earn all of those $20 bills, only to have to give them away. That is, if you even get a job in your degree's line of work at all, considering that job prospects have been all-time low, and an apparent half of graduates are working in a position that doesn't require a degree. So, what's the solution to this crisis? <laughs> I know! Free college! Free college! I know! I know! I know! Listen to me! I know! Listen to me! Now, to close this episode, a lot of you have been asking me how I do my research. Apparently, some of you are impressed, so here's my method. I actually start with the creationist argument. Although a lot of the arguments I take on are from Kent Hovind, usually Answers in Genesis, the Institute for Creation Research, and Creation Ministries International have much more in-depth versions of those arguments. Also, unlike Kent Hovind, those three organizations tend to make their references easily available. Usually, just checking the references in a creationist argument is enough to get an idea of how they've misrepresented the science. From there, I'll also go to more secular sources. Time, National Geographic, and I'm not even ashamed to say that I often check Wikipedia because, although they are not a valid source in and of themselves, they do require citations for content. This is occasionally a nice tool to get you started. Some non-peer-reviewed publications cover scientific findings as they occur, but they are a little cryptic as to what their sources are. Oftentimes, it will simply direct you to the journal website, but without an issue nor a title for the paper. In cases like this, I'll examine the article for names of scientists associated with the discovery and then Google their names with the name of the journal and the overall topic. Eventually, I find the title of the paper. Once I have that, I simply type in the name of the paper in quotes into Google, and then I find several copies of it around the web. I do my best to simply get to the primary sources as quickly as possible, but even when I do, there are still some issues that I face. Chief among them is that most modern journals only post the abstracts of their papers and require you to either purchase the paper or subscribe to the journal if you wish to read the whole thing. Obviously, most people can't afford to purchase every paper or subscribe to every journal, so I have found two ways around this. The first way around it is to 
visit a local university library. This is a step that I suspect most people would never consider, but I happen to enjoy libraries, so it's the first thing I choose to do. And beside that, it's free. Now, I happen to live near the University of Nevada in Las Vegas. They have a seven-story library, and the top couple stories are dedicated to peer-reviewed journals. I also travel to San Diego on occasion, so I'm able to access the libraries at San Diego State University and the University of California, San Diego. Both libraries are excellent. Another way to read the full paper is to look at whom the paper tells you to contact for correspondence and just ask them for a free copy. There's always the chance they might say no, but so far I have yet to be refused when I've asked them to send me a copy. So now you've got the paper and you've read it and it goes way over your head. Contacting the author is also a great way to clarify the points they make. So yes, it can be difficult to find original sources and even when you find them, they can be difficult to understand but those problems can be overcome with some patience and tenacity. As you can see, starting from the creationist argument and chasing down the original sources is exactly how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.